you know, focus on their strengths and, and remind them of their strengths and help them cultivate them. Because again, as Joseph Renzulli said, I didn't make this up, you know, no one cares about Einstein's ability to paint or Picasso's ability to do math. So let's lean into our kids' strengths and let's give them space to explore them. Let's not fix, but explore. Welcome back to Mother's Guide Through Autism podcast. I'm Bridget Shipman, your host, and today I'm going to be speaking with Sam Young, MED, or Mr. Sam, as his community members call him. Sam is a growth-minded, two-time Fulbright Scholar and a director of Young Scholars Academy, a strength-based, talent-focused virtual enrichment school that supports twice exceptionally differently wired and gifted students to feel seen, nurtured, and happy as heck through strength-based courses, camps, and community. Mr. Sam is a neurodivergent educator who has ADHD. As an ADHD learner, he has committed his life to empowering young people to learn to develop their superpowers and lead meaningful and fulfilling lives through strength-based education. Mr. Sam is a graduate of Bridges Graduate School of Cognitive Diversity, where he studied under the legendary Dr. Susan Baum. He has been featured in the documentary 2E2, Teaching the Twice Exceptional, the textbook, Understanding the Social and Emotional Lives of Gifted Students. Variations Magazine, over 30 podcasts, including the amazing Debbie Reber's Tilt Parenting, countless conferences, seminars, 2E News, and other publications. Today, I'm so excited to have Mr. Sam on our show. We're going to be talking to a uh, to Sam about his own experiences as a neurodivergent person, as you've heard in the bio, but also all the cool stuff and and this work that Mr. Sam's doing out in the world to help anyone, but for our audience to help our kids who are on the spectrum. So welcome to Mother's Guide Through Autism, Sam. Thank you, Bridget. I'm really excited to be here and I've really enjoyed our conversation so far, so I'm excited to get into this one. Yeah, so I love to visit with anyone who comes to Mother's Guide Through Autism because I feel like there's so much work to be done and everyone that I talk to, that's why I love doing this work, has something that um, everyone can learn from. So this podcast is about knowledge, hope, and inspiration. And so I am learning right along with everybody else. And so I know that you have a lot to share with with anyone who's listening out there. So I'm going to dive in with you are a neurodivergent educator who has ADHD. And I mentioned that in the bio, but I don't, if you don't mind, could you share about your childhood growing up with ADHD and how that impacted your family, your social, and your academic life, you as as that person? Yeah, I think I spent a great deal of time and still do with kind of the fallout of a lot of the kind of struggles and, and deficit stuff. I mean, with every diagnosis comes strengths and comes struggles. And I think a lot of my experience around education, especially, was kind of steeped in the struggles. It, I didn't necessarily always have the language or the understanding, even after having a diagnosis um, with setting reasonable expectations, with understanding that things were going to be different for me, with time management. And, you know, it started very early on, um, but it was something that always affected and, and continues, honestly, if I'm being, you know, vulnerable, it continues to affect me in the way in which I I accomplish things or or set expectations for myself to accomplish things. And so I think learning that, um, well, there are struggles. Like my parents did a great job growing up that there are also going to be like areas which I am, you know, 
strong, maybe stronger than others. I might struggle more and it's easy to focus on that, but I can kind of shift my perspective. And that that's kind of something that's always stayed with me. It's really easy to get wrapped up and I still do almost every day in the things that I struggle with, but trying to make that commitment to, to shifting towards my strengths too. Yeah, I think as we learn more and more about how the brain works, I think there's so many folks that I talk to that are grown that are just getting diagnosed um, later in life. And they're like, oh, all of a sudden things begin to make sense. So you said your journey started when you were really young. How old were you when you were diagnosed? I think I got my, it was fourth grade was when I was diagnosed with ADHD, but it was, um, it was something that was kind of like challenged. I was sort of on the border. So we kind of, you know, discovered that that might be something, but didn't really do much about it at that time. Um, my, we did like interventions and things with reading and I got like a tutor and we did phonics and stuff. Um, but it wasn't necessarily something where there was a moment where we said, Oh, this is, you know, going to be part of who Sam is now. I don't think that really sunk in until later. And yeah. so I kind of joked that I was diagnosed like three times. It happened again in 10th grade. And then I was like, let me just make sure. And it happened again in college too. <laughs> different different kind of periods of, of the going back and forth with, you know, the, honestly, not the weight of the diagnosis, but the, um, I think, transitions and things that have to have come with it. Like, yeah. Do I take meds. What meds do I take? So I started taking meds in 10th grade and then would go on and off. And it was like a, a wheel where I'd kind of hop on, do really well academically, but really suffer emotionally or socially. And then I would switch and then I would struggle academically, but I'd be happier. And I felt like I was constantly kind of making these deals, you know, like with myself, like, all right, I'm just going to do this for a short period of time, but then it'd be a struggle. So I'd switch. Yeah, that makes sense. And, um, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of um, moms in particular listen to this, but I think I also have a lot of teachers. There, there's a, uh, as this show has been, you know, what are we now? Over three years. So our population is is more diverse than it was when we started. So as as we talk about this, and I know, I know we focus on the struggles. So we're just going to talk about like what were some of your struggles a little bit longer. But then I do, I do want to give um, anyone who's listening, um, you know, and I, I know your program and everything we're going to be talking about <clears throat> is just what, what, um, what advice, you know, I want to make sure that we give everyone who's listening some really of your best practices and, um, some great advice on how to help kids that are, you know, maybe just now getting diagnosed and as parents, you know, all we do is worry. So, um, you know, maybe some advice there too. So let's go back to just a little bit of your struggles growing up. Um, what, what were some of the the largest struggles do you feel like? I know there's so many, right? But what really rings out? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest one that kind of permeates, and this is true for many people, is this idea that we are stupid, right? That like, I am not as good at people as people, or I am a bad student. And I would not, like, I, I, that wasn't something that people would say to me. I was really lucky in that I never got bullied or any of that stuff. Um, I was, my strengths were that I was pretty kind of gregarious and I'm a social person and an extrovert. So I could mask a lot of the struggles and then kind of take it home. And it would be kind of something I would deal with in private or with my family. Um, so there was a lot of masking, which is hiring, but and the struggles were really just the amount of time that it took for me to do things. I mean, I would, I would, um, whether it was young learning to read, and I, I always struggled with reading and still do. Um, and that's not something that just kind of gets better, right? You just, you don't like grow out of that. You just evolve and you develop strategies and discover audiobooks, you know, things like that, that <laughs> just weren't available when I was younger. Um, but the, I think a big struggle was the amount of time that things would take I would go home and just have no life ever and from middle school to college because it was just work all the time it felt like and it just took so long to read 
Um, I struggled. I mean, in college, I almost dropped out of my, I was a history major and there was like over a hundred, you know, pages of per class per night or whatever it might be. And I just thought like, I can't do this. I'm not going to be a good history teacher. And I just struggled, struggled, struggled. And I was a lot of self negative self-talk. And I think probably one of the other big ones. So, so to answer your question, one is the amount of time that it takes to do things. And then the other is, is expectations. I mean, there's a big, when we look at like the executive functions of people who are differently wired, whether they be especially autistic and, and ADHDers, there is a big disconnect between um, like in goal setting and our ability to kind of plan and then act. Um, and I always struggle with that. I mean, I wake up every day with an unrealistic expectation of what I can accomplish. And then because of the way my brain works and because of the way things happen, you know, I'm enticed by things that pop up, which can derail me because they feel urgent and important. And mm -hmm. then I kind of go to bed disappointed. And it's something that I really, you know, struggle with. And I think a big reason, like I'm a huge proponent for everyone being in therapy. I, I joke that there's two kinds of people in this world, those that are in therapy and those that need to be, but especially <laughs> people who are differently wired, I think, because really it's that constant kind of comparison and a set of expectations so for me the cycle is and it's a harmful one and it's something that i don't talk about often but it's sort of going getting up really charged like this is going to be a different day and then going to bed that was just like every other you know and just that kind of cycle of like struggling to produce struggling to accomplish and struggling to stay focused has been probably the other the second bucket of difficulty for me yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm thinking of, you know, and, and you too, when you watch other kids, you know, when you're a teacher and my hunch is that you, you could really help these young people because you understand their struggles. And so how, how do you turn those struggles into success like you did? Because obviously you're uh, an extremely intelligent, bright young man. I mean, you're on fire over there. Uh -huh. I love the work you're doing. I'm a fan of yours. So how do you, how do you turn those struggles in, into success? how do you do that? Yeah, I think it's, it, you know, it's a journey. Um, I go back to good therapist advice that I've gotten over the, my life. And, and, you know, I'm also someone who's fairly anxious because of that discrepancy between what I think I can do and what I often do. Um, and I, there's that comparison gap that, you know, they say comparison is a thief of joy. Yes. Um, my, this therapist that I had, actually my first therapist, incredible advice. He said that, you know, you're kind of on a journey with your diagnosis. So you might as well put your arm around it and just walk forward with it. And that's going to come with the difficulties as well. And so with that, yeah, ADHD um, comes things like anxiety and depression, right? Which we don't talk about much. I think like the kind of meme of someone who's autistic or ADHD, who's like scattered or hyper-focused, but with it are all these other elements, right? Um, and so I think letting students know that there are going to be difficult times, but that's not necessarily who they are. It's just a part of who they are. And mm -hmm. that more often than not, our big thing, like the whole kind of mission behind you know, my work and the work at Young Scholars Academy is that it's really about context, right? That that you could take, um, and I, I said this to you previously, I think, but my favorite uh, psychologist, Dr. Joseph Renzulli said, no one cares about Einstein's ability to paint or Picasso's ability to do math, right? So yes. why are we so obsessed with students bringing the bottom up? Right? Why are we so focused on helping our students who struggle in an area get better at their struggles. I mean, sure, that's important. It's important to have that kind of stick with itness and overcome adversity. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really build that positive self-affect. So the, the, one of the number one ways to answer your question to, to go from struggles to strengths is, first of all, identifying them. What yes. are your strengths? Inventorying them. And then putting our students in a space of their strengths. If you want me to do spreadsheets, forget about it. That's hell for me. I can't focus. I can't track the columns. It's really difficult for me. Um, but if you want me to get on a podcast, I'll do that all day. And I won't even prepare for it because it's just where I'm really comfortable. Yeah. And so I don't belong doing spreadsheets, but there's probably someone out there whose hell would be podcasts and heaven would be spreadsheets, right? So 
I think that we, if we can remind our students that they, despite what school often tells them, they don't need to be good at everything. In fact, that's not productive. That leads to that self harm and kind of self doubt and all that stuff. But instead, let's figure out what they're really good at by exploring all kinds of things. And then whatever feels good and piques them, let's delve deeper into that. Yeah, and you and I talked about this before. I I, I absolutely love it because that's what I did in education was help, help kids um, do their self-discovery work and make education make sense, right? What make it relevant. Um, they're wise, so to speak. And so we are absolutely on the same page. And um, I, I really, I really love that you chose education as a career. So how did you go from all that to going, okay, I'm going to be an educator? Yeah, I think I had this, my whole life, I loved to teach. Like, as long as I can remember, I, my first memories, like in school or in kindergarten and pre-K and anytime I would learn something, I would really get charged up by sharing it with people. And I've been like that my whole life. I love to kind of be at the forefront of understanding something so that I can distill it down and make it accessible for other people. And I later in life realized that's how I learn, right? By, by processing something because I'm auditory and kind of going through and then sharing it with others. So that kind of, um, you know, taxonomy of, of, of teaching and sharing and analyzing and so forth. But it wasn't really until I got into some later grades, <clears throat> excuse me, when I got into some of the later grades, like in high school, and I had this incredible English teacher, Mr. Dunphy, and he just demanded more out of me. I remember like on the first day he held me after and I thought I was in trouble and I was in a lower level English class. And because again, I didn't think I was smart and I was kind of, you know, this kind of student and so forth. And he's like, young, which is my last name. What are you doing here? I was like, uh, what do you mean, sir? And, you know, he's like, you're wasting your time and mine. You don't belong in this class. You should be in an AP class. Um, and it, it was really the first time that someone made a snapshot of, uh, assessment of me and wanted more out of me in an English setting where I struggled to read and struggled to write. But he had debate in his class and he had uh, kind of take a stands and he just made me feel so good. I stayed in this class, even though he wanted me to do better because he taught it. And it was just so incredible. And I spent the whole year with him and I always wanted to be better for him. And I just decided this is what I want to do. I want to be someone who gives this to other people. And I'm getting goosebumps even talking about it right now. I know, and I am too. It was just such a beautiful year. And I just never let go of that. I mean, again, as I mentioned before, there were doubts when I was in college reading a lot. And, and um, I, I had ma amazing mentors. This is a big theme in my life. I almost dropped out of my history program. And my I had this other teacher, Mr. Buxton, and he was like the top teacher in the state. And he retired and became a mentor in my education department. And he was kind of mentoring me. And I almost, I was, I, I, I signed on to be a history teacher originally. I was really excited about 20th century U.S. history. And I was going to drop out my, my sophomore year. We were getting ready to student teach the next year. I thought, I just don't know what I'm doing. And he said, you know, on the first day of school, when I was teaching, I had a student who asked me about Sacagawea when I was teaching about Lewis and Clark. And I said that that wasn't a person and that they were mixed up. Like, I knew so little at the time, but I knew <laughs> I wanted to teach and like points to this thing on his wall, which is like, you know, state of Rhode Island teacher of the year. And he's like, but I didn't get that because of my content knowledge. I got that because I understand people. And he said, you, the content can come and go, but you have a skill that you can't learn, which is how to identify people's strengths and help them overcome their struggles. And he said, you can't learn that. So you have to keep going. You can't quit. And again, it just like goosebumps again. I was just like, I want to be like these people. I want to change lives. And so I went into teaching and I taught all over and taught in Rhode Island. And then I had an amazing job in France. And um, I came back teaching from France and then moved to California, which was always my dream and taught um, at this school called Bridges Academy, which was the first school that, that taught twice exceptional students, which these are students who are basically I am one and didn't understand the words at the time. But there's this idea of these dual exceptionalities so someone with an exceptional strength area, which could be like two standard deviations over on a bell curve, and then someone with an exceptional struggle like autism or dyslexia or ADHD. 
And so this kind of divide, and I thought when I first discovered this, that was like, this something I need to be a part of. This is kind of who I am. This is who my dad was, as I kind of realized, better understanding my own self, looking back at my childhood and everything. And I thought, wow, I'm going to do this. And then, sorry if I'm going on too long of a rant. <laughs> no, I I love it. Uh, actually, that was going to be, uh, uh, that's what I wanted to ask you about next, because I personally, um, when you brought this to my attention, twice exceptional, and what it means, you know, how do you, like, as a parent or a teacher or somebody who's working with kids, how do you, how do you identify these, these people? You know, it's a complex thing. So, so, I mean, the official answer would be to have them get like a neuropsych evaluation, right? Where they do like a battery of tests and intelligence tests, like the WISC or other tests that they would take, and then they would get an official diagnosis. Um, the unofficial answer is that it's complex. It's, there's, we often say that there's kind of three kinds of masking that happen and masking is this idea that one element we, we talk this is talked about a lot in autism circles that one one element or one part of someone is covered and um in in, in twice exceptional circles we say that there's three kinds the one is that the gift is masked by the learning differences so someone's autism adhd auditory processing whatever it might be is so kind of loud it covers the person's gift and they seem like they're just someone with learning differences then there's the gift being so pronounced that it can cover the learning difference. So they might just appear as gifted or highly able. Um, this could be someone, usually people who are incredibly verbal. So they're really charming or they're like able to cover the fact that they're you know, not producing because they can engage in such incredible conversation and discourse. Um, and then the third one is the most difficult is when they both are kind of vibrating at the same level and they cover one another and and this can be the hardest to detect because it's someone that might appear as neither gifted nor learning difference and they're both at the same time they're just kind of struggling yeah so that that is something um when i'm listening to you i like all these people are popping into my head where you know i, I just didn't know the term twice exceptional i just thought strengths weaknesses you know mm -hmm. um, but i i i think that's very interesting and i love that you're talking about the different kinds of masking because i'm pretty sure at some point all of us have, have masked some some part of ourselves right but then you add you know like i'll use my son joseph who is on the autistic spectrum who i think definitely his disability masked his all the other cool stuff that he can do right and it is it is complex i mean to be able to identify that um because that's i think why it's so confusing as a parent to go that that denial thing pops up so easily because you know joseph's a genius are you sure he's a are you sure he's on the spectrum? And, it, and then, uh, you know, his speech and everything is so obvious. Um, but yeah, it, it it is. It's complex. And I think people who are out there um, that are dealing with it or anybody who's raising somebody or a teacher, you know, just to give each other some grace in, in this life journey, I think, is the underlying message here because it is so complex. Um, you teach people, and, and I'm very curious about this too, the strength-based model of thriving. What does that look like? Let, can, can I quickly revisit something that you just said, Bridget? And then I would just, love for yeah. you to. Okay, so yeah. you, said, you said something that's interesting, but I think that I really want to underscore this and kind of um, piggyback off it, which is that I think parents in often case have a clear... Um, lean towards seeing their students' strengths. And I think that the education system often leans towards seeing struggles because they can be pronounced in certain settings. And both are important. And, and, and that's kind of a controversial point. But I think parents need to fight for their students' strengths to be seen by others. 
right? And, and constantly reminded, if you're going to IEP meetings, if you're um, homeschooling, um, you know, preparing your child to do whatever comes next, it's always important to remind them of their strengths and remind others of their strengths. So especially, you know, if your families are listening to this podcast, you know, leading up to the school year, let's say, you know, it's incredibly important to, to kind of maybe reach out to teachers and, and let them know fairly early on, not overwhelming the, you know, the with like writing a short story, but quick kind of quick hitter bullet points to teachers about the student's strengths that they may not otherwise see, but being told they could leverage that that's really important. I also like to play devil's advocate, though, and say it is important to be aware that there might be learning differences present, because if we really want to help our kiddos, early interventions help, right? Not harmful interventions, like things that can be like uh, traumatic, like some behavioral therapy and certain things like that. But if we know, for example, we have a student that's really bright and they may be dyslexic and we say, oh, that they're just, you know, really quirky. We're actually doing them a disservice by perhaps not getting them early interventions. Because if you look at brain scans, of people who are dyslexic, for example, you know, some of these working with neuropsychologists and uh, educational therapists and so forth, we can see that actual like neural connections and the ways in which the brain is firing or not firing. Um, so it's important to do both. It's important to focus on the strengths. And it's important to be aware that if there are learning differences, we want to get the supports that can help them make these strides forward, not steeping them in there, like you're broken, we need to fix you. I say we never want to bring the bottom up, we want to raise the roof, but it's still important to support our kids. So I I'm just want to be clear. I think that's a really important thing for parents to, to keep in mind. I, I agree with you. And I think it is, a, it is important to talk about because, um, you know, in, in our book, A Mother's Guide Through Autism, I talk about advocating with kindness because I've been on both sides of it, right? I was the educator and then I was the parent of a child uh, on the autism spectrum. So I, I think um, just to add to that, and, and then we'll go on to your cool stuff, but uh, while you're preparing for these IEP meetings, I think maybe reaching out to one of us, right, get some extra support, because I know it's terrifying, but it's also terrifying for the teacher, and I've brought this up in other podcasts before because I don't feel like our educators are being trained for full inclusion classrooms. Um, there's there, there's so much to be done in education um, coming from uh, as a public school teacher. And so it's it's our job as parents to try to stay as positive as, as possible and understand that the teacher more than likely doesn't have the answers. You think they should because they're the teacher, but that doesn't mean that they were trained in your in what your child's deficits are. So I really, really encourage what, what you suggested, um, reaching out and saying, hey, you know, can we have like a pre-meeting or, you know, really, really advocate with kindness for your child. And, and with that said, we're you, we're going to advocate for this child and my child will be educated and I'm not going to take I'm just no is not an option mm -hmm. you can do it with love right yeah yeah that's right yeah and don't <laughs> rush to sign anything too I think that's important you know you can always have a second meeting and a third meeting especially with those IEPs um, so yeah, I think that's really good advice and you do have such a unique perspective of being on both ends of that that table. And I think that's really helpful. Yeah. As do you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I am so curious about your uh, strength-based model of thriving. We all need that. I, I want to sign up. What does that look like? So, I mean, it, it really comes down to the fact that, again, society and education are not aligned and the things that we want in school are kind of converging to the norm. It's kind of uh, making everyone good at everything right but as a society that's not what we want at all and what i've done and for people who are watching the because i know this is going to be on on video and podcast so for people that are watching if you see my logo over here you see that it's a circle with a square around it and then there's that little bit in the middle that's kind of both colors and the for anyone who can't see or whether you can see the square it represents, and this, this is based on the work of my former mentor, Dr. Susan Baum. 
And she said, she wrote a book, it was really the first book about uh, twice exceptional before there was even a term twice exceptional. And it was called lifted, uh, excuse me, gifted and learning disabled. And in that she said, yellow represents our gift areas and the blue kind of the circle represents our struggle areas, our learning differences. And then the green is the whole person. Mm. And I kind of took that one step further when we made this logo and said that, you know, I love the saying that the square peg in the round hole. So if you can see the square is yellow. And the reason is because those edges make us stand out, mm. right? And often society wants the blue. They want to kind of knock our edges off and focus on us being round and fitting in. But in society, we don't celebrate people who are rounded. We don't celebrate people who are success. I say like the best way to be successful and to be incredibly wealthy is never to be well-rounded, right? It's, <laughs> it's people who, you know, go heavily into one space. Now that can be risky. We have to be careful teaching that message to our kids because we don't want them to end up, you know, betting it all on black and then struggling. But the reality is when we look at, you know, I often joke about this, but I picture, you know, at some time, George Lucas in the back of a classroom and, you know, elementary school, allegedly he created the first Star Wars characters when he was, you know, eight or 10 or something like that. And I picture him in, in some classroom, you know, he's got his notebook open and some teacher's like, George, put your doodles away, you know, and it, it's laughable when we say it like that, right? Here's it someone is. who has created arguably the most well-known galaxy, right? Which is not even a real one, um, which we're obsessed with as a culture, but someone at some point was telling him to stop drawing, stop dreaming, stop doing. And when we talk about a strength-based model of thriving, it's getting our students to identify their own strengths and access them through differentiated learning and focus heavily on them. Because again, you know, no one cares about Simone Biles reading comprehension, right? Or, or Richard Branson's ability to do a whatever, or Greta Thunberg's, you know, statistics score, right? It's, and these are all people who are neurodivergent, who I would classify as twice exceptional, um, because they have great strengths and great struggles, right? Simone Biles, a world-renowned gold medalist gymnast, has dyslexia and ADHD. I don't care, because when she's on the mat, she's absolutely crushing it, right? So when we talk about strength development and talent development, we're talking about helping our young people explore things that they may never otherwise see. Like here at Young Scholars Academy, we try to teach all the unconventional stuff that you can't find most places. So whether it's like coding or AI or robotics or improv or theater, um, you know, speech and debate, Dungeons and Dragons, like things that are gonna be real passion areas. I have a bunch of friends who are musicians and artists and directors and writers, and they did not necessarily get to where they are because of their school. I say they got there in spite of their schooling. Yes. And so, so strength and talent development are where we're leaning into the unconventional stuff, the stuff that our kids would do outside of school. And then we're giving them the two key factors for success, which is number one, differentiated content that they can access in a way that makes sense with their learning preference. So whether it be, you know, um, we say content process products, right? And environment, those are the big ones. So is the content differentiated in a way they can access it? Is the process, you know, can they listen to a podcast, watch a video, read an article? Is the product, whatever they're producing, differentiated? Can they do those things? Can they do a podcast? Can they record a video? Is it authentic? And then is the environment conducive? And that environment is my second part where I say that there's really two key factors, kind of the X and the Y axis for success, which is neurodivergent mentors, people like you and I who, who can help our kids and say, you know, as a mom, I've been there, or as a neurodivergent adult, I've been there, and, you know, it's going to be okay. And that person also has to be a content expert, because our kids are so bright. For example, I have a 10-year-old who's got a 179 IQ, right, which is, wow. she's 10 years old. She, she made, in our engineering class recently, she made like a claw machine out of um, uh, cardboard, and I mean, it actually functions. It's incredible. And by the way, Einstein's IQ was like in the 130s. So here's this young kiddo. I mean, what do you do with that, right? That's a really difficult thing. And because our kids going on a tangent here, but like imagine being 10 and being that bright, like you understand climate change and you have the social emotional regulation of someone who's maybe eight 
or so. And that's like really difficult to process the weight of that, right? The water's rising, you know, the, 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 the planet's heating up. Um, they understand it intellectually. They're not necessarily just interested in like Pokemon and things like that. They're like dealing with the weight of the world. Yeah. And, and the other factor, so we have these neurodivergent mentors and then putting these kids in settings where they have like-minded peers, where they can realize there's nothing wrong with them. They're just like other people, not everyone else, but other people. And those people are together. And the research is really clear that when you put differently wired kids in, a, in a, a, like a setting with similar kids, they experience more positive self-image, yeah. more sense of belonging, more trust, and more openness. And so we really say we have to have that key differentiation. We need to have mentors who can support our kids and sort of help them along the way, help encourage them to grow and take risks. Um, focus on their strengths and then and steep them with other kids who are just like them. And that seems to be the recipe for success that we have for, for helping our students thrive and develop their strengths. I love that. Um, and, and I'm guessing, I mean, this is so, I think, needed. I mean, I was thinking the whole time you were talking, man, wish you would have been around when Joseph was um, going to school, because I, I really feel like, um, Although he is doing very well because he is twice exceptional um, also, but your success stories have got to really be um, in a high margin. Um, what are, what, can you share some of those with, with the strength uh, based model with kids with autism in particular? Yeah, we have, um, we just had an open house last week, actually, in each open house, I invite like three family, we have 14 mentors at Young Scholars Academy, who are our teachers, we call them mentors. And we call our community like a virtual village. Um, we have about 200 families enrolled at any given semester. And um, they're, they join us from all over the world, which is really cool, because it's virtual. So at our open house last week, we, we usually invite about three families to come in and kind of share their story, because it, I see it kind of like the hero's journey, you know, it's like kids who are just a little bit further along because they've maybe been with us for a year or two or three, and they kind of share their journey to inspire other families. And one of the ones that came up is there's always kind of a trend throughout the night. But one of the ones that came up uh, at an open house prior, which came up again at this last one, is a term that's now been coined because of this one kiddo. And his family's developed something called, they call the YSA glow, which is that when this kid takes improv, he takes improv every Tuesday and has for well over a year, that he said he feels a glow for 24 hours. And he's autistic and, you know, spends a lot of time a bit feeling a bit anxious and struggling. And, and they said that they try to have a class at least every 24 hours because just the feeling of, of like being goofy, being silly, being asynchronous and doing it with a quirky mentor who gets them and doing it with like six other kids who are like them. It just seems to be this space where the, the kids just feel kind of high for, yeah. for 24 hours and feel euphoric and feel good. And, and, and I could share hundreds of stories like that, but that's the big, the big takeaway. It's that our kids are building confidence that the focus is not on their deficits, um, but it's on their strengths because you know, you go back to like that seminal book from like a hundred years ago, I think 1937, Dale Carnegie wrote the famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. And in the book, he, he he said something to the effect of, you know, people are always going to be more drawn to praise than anything else. Right. And it's so true. Like, why do we focus so much on helping students like get better and and tell them what they're not doing, that's really harmful. If we praise them and empower them, and give them roles, they're going to grow into them. So, you know, another victory that came out of that night to answer your, your question about like kind of testimonials, um, a, a mom and a young girl who, who the mom said, was like, we would have like daily meltdowns. And now we try to have a YSA class where that doesn't happen anymore because there's just a like kind of a goofiness when, when, her child leaves, but also like rigor too. I mean, um, the we have a class called Tools of War and Weird History. And so Tools of War is like World War One, World War II weapons where the kids 
you know, they get like a weapon or an item. It could be like the parachute or like a certain gas or a tank or something. And they have to really research, like wrestle with primary documents and, and then do a presentation over like over eight weeks they present at the end. And this girl got so into it. She's like, I've never been so pushed. I've never been so motivated. And then she took that to like a, like a state fair and presented her research from class there. And she, it's like the hardest I've ever worked. And it was the most exciting like class I've ever had in my life. And then the mom's like, yeah, like she's just, she was so motivated and it's just a space where, where, where students can have their whole selves nourished, you know, where they can, the social element, the emotional element, the intellectual element, and, and we can kind of let go of how it comes to pass and they can just be like seen and yeah. supported and not fixed, but um, nurtured. I love it. Um, you know, I was an elementary teacher when I started out and I always, when I went to the secondary area of education, I always said, you know, I'm all about teaching to the whole child. And that's what it sounds like you're doing and embracing these kids and who they are and building. Like I, I loved when you said, let's, we build them. We just, you know, make the roof higher. Mm -hmm concentrate and, and try to push these kids down. So I'm, like I said, I'm a big, big, big fan. Um, so now we've got everyone really curious, Mr. Sam. So what we need to talk about, or I, I'm so curious too, is tell us about Young Scholars Academy and what it does. So we, we've talked a lot about, um, the philosophy and, you know, the important parts in my opinion but how does it work tell us about it yeah so so as i mentioned previously i taught at the school bridges academy which was really the first school to teach twice exceptional students here in los angeles where i live and i worked there for about 10 years and bridges was amazing they have a um, graduate school that they founded they have a research center and um, it's a fantastic place and this is where i really developed this worldview that I have about seeing strengths and so forth because of my mentors and the program there. And then when the pandemic hit, I was actually getting ready to leave and I wanted to start a micro school. I was going to start a small school here in LA that was like Bridges, but was my own take on kind of project-based enrichment learning without grades. And I, of course, pivoted like many other people during the pandemic. And uh, some families asked me to teach some of the classes that I taught, but online to students who didn't go there. And so I did. And then it kind of grew and grew. And then it kind of became this thing, which I wasn't prepared for, which was this kind of virtual village. Like people were coming together from all over the country at a time that was really difficult. Um, and then eventually it was people were coming from all over the world. And the goal was as everything we've talked about today, strength-based talent-focused learning. And it kind of grew and grew and eventually people were asking for things that were not my strength. So I started to hire amazing people that I'd worked with. And um, now we are, as mentioned, we're, we're a virtual enrichment school. So we run courses and summer camps um, and parent community events. And really the goal is to support the whole family. So our vision is to support through weekly offerings, um, giving students one hour to 20 hours a week of strength and passion exploration. And that happens through all the unconventional classes that we've mentioned. Um, the, the, the real vision is to have a virtual village where people are supporting one another. Parents get support, students get support, and there's a sense of community. Um, we have classes that range from we have so we have like five semesters a year, which is like fall one, fall two, winter, and then spring one, spring two. But then we also have classes for older students that run the gamut of the year. So they run nine months, and those are even college board uh, approved courses. Like we have advanced placement courses. Um, we teach four AP courses, psychology. Um, well, actually, there's more than four, but we're running four this year. We have psychology, government, art history, and European history. And um, we also have some year-long courses on adulting, helping our students get ready to take the next step, right? teaching all the stuff that school often doesn't. Um, and, and many of our courses exist for, for fun, right? There, as I mentioned, we have like Dungeons and Dragons and Minecraft. And 
Um, but we also have really high level stuff like we, where we have math and statistics courses where, you know, 11 and 12 year olds are calculating like insurance rates, <laughs> but we're doing it in like a fun edgy way because we're like, you know, why is it, you know, uh, more dangerous to be a male? Uh, when it comes to insurance, right? And what what's the you know death rate? Like all the stuff the kids would like want to do outside of class, and that's a big theme with our classes. We have like dark history, you know, and and things that like the kids would research when the school day ended. And we thought, well, let's just legitimize those and lean into them rather than fight them. Right. Uh, so, yes, I love that. Yeah, and so there's there's a, a bunch of different offerings. We have over thirty classes a semester with over seventy hours a week of of sessions. And um, again, the big vision is just building community. So outside of those classes, there are also biweekly events. It could be like a student showcase night. Um, we also have amazing experts, Debbie Reber, um, Dr. Susan Baum, Seth Perler, some of like the biggest names in the field um, are coming. Seth Perler's coming next week to talk to our families. And it's just, I mean, these are, you know, big people, hundreds of thousands of followers and, and they come to our little virtual village. They talk to our, you know, 150 or 200 families and the parents come together. And the coolest thing is that they're doing that, right? That they're, they're learning from these experts, but you can do that on YouTube, but they're also getting to share and connect and, and open up. And so um, as we evolve, we're also kind of building out that element as well, where parents can be a part and be more involved in their in their child's education because we truly want it to be this this bubble of of nurturing of strength and talent development and of support for our kids yeah yeah and the the parents play a huge role in in the support right in the part of the community and so um you know what did what advice do you have for parents not only for <clears throat> I, I want you so it's going to be two i want to know what your advice is for parents raising a child on the spectrum, but I also would like to know what your advice is for parents in getting the support and being part of a community um, to help them. I think the first one, advice for parents, you know, of, of kids on the spectrum is, it's really everything that I've said today. It's, it's, you know, I think of, have you ever seen that comic it's like a teacher at a desk and there's a bunch of animals next to a tree. Yes. Yeah. So there's like a dolphin and like a pigeon and a squirrel and a giraffe or an elephant or something like that. And the teacher's like, okay, um, you know, today's test is going to be to climb that tree, right? There's like a goldfish in a bowl, you know, it's absurd. Right. <laughs> and I think the, the big takeaway for parents that I hope parents can have is realize the absurdity of focusing on your kids' deficits you know, focus on their strengths and, and remind them of their strengths and help them cultivate them. Because again, as Joseph Renzulli said, I didn't make this up, you know, no one cares about Einstein's ability to paint or Picasso's ability to do math. So let's lean into our kids' strengths and let's give them space to explore them. Let's not fix, but explore. Instead of, I have an autistic kid, we need to get them into a social skills class. That's a fundamental fix-it thing, right? That The, the problem, socializing. The solution, the class. Instead, what if we do something like we do here? Why don't we have a Dungeons and Dragons quest? Or why don't we have Minecraft where, hold on, it's not your turn. We have to wait. I know you're really excited, but we want to make sure that we're reciprocating and that we're working together. And what if not everyone's on the same page? You know, can we make it authentic? Can we make it feel good? Can we make it something that matters? And then bake in everything along the way. I think that's a really important one. I love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm like over here going yes yes yes. <laughs> your second one about parent support it, it's don't go it alone I mean that's why we have these community events we're on the on the cusp of building something to su better support our parents which is going to be more regular membership and I know you have your amazing program Bridget supporting parents and it's join join programs I mean parents are quick to support their kids um, and not themselves and you know I'm a, I'm an Eagle Scout. I, I was like really into scouting and safety and CPR. And when you're an Eagle Scout, you have to take all these life-saving classes. And the first rule of life-saving or emergency medical services is don't put yourself in jeopardy because then there's two victims, uh, right? And yeah. so parents, before you jump into the water to save, you got to take care of yourself. I know that's easier said than done. Full disclosure, I'm not even a parent yet. So I think it's important to say that because people can say, yeah, great advice, Sam, but uh, it's different when you're not sleeping. I hear you. 
um, but you have to do something for you. And I think that starts with just realizing that you're not alone and you don't need to be alone and that you're probably not doing things the most efficient way because you're reinventing the wheel. And I think connecting to a community, like what you're doing, Bridget, um, what I'm doing, what other people are doing out there, um, and just belonging to something that you can realize I'm seen, I'm not alone, people are doing what I'm doing. There's people who are a little bit further along than I am. There's people not as far as I am. I can get support from one group and give support to another. Yes. Yeah. I I I am just so um I I love the way that that you explain that too, because I think everyone can relate to it, whether you're a parent or you're not, that concept of of realizing, okay, if I don't take care of myself, I'm not going to do anybody else any good either. You know, maybe a day or two, but it, it will catch you. It, it, it catches all of us. So I, I love that you're, that you do have the support set up for your folks. You're building a community. This is so needed. This, this is just um, from from uh, all parents and teachers and anybody out there, just thank you for, for your work. Um, I also, just before we go, is there anything else you wanted to mention or let our listeners know? I would say, I mean, I obviously believe in the work that we're doing. And I would say I have a, you know, an obligation to tell everyone to check us out because um, it's fall now, uh, just about. And um, you know, we have an amazing fall lineup and I th you'll see, you know, I think something like 93% of our families, you know, come in and have so much fun. They tell other people and I th something like 96% of our families are stay for a year. Um, so I would say, you know, this is the best time, you know, going back to school can be a really difficult time, especially for our differently wired kiddos and I think offering them some, some kind of salvation and some space. This is the moment. I would encourage everyone to come and check out Young Scholars Academy. And also, I would just say that some of our courses are year round and the enrollment only opens once. And so it's this um, this is the best time, I think, to to come check us out and and and, and hop in and, and join our virtual village of support and nurturing. Yeah, my hunch is that anyone who hears this podcast is going to go, OK, Mr. Sam, where do I sign up? So where can folks go? Where where can we go? To, to find out more about your work and, and to sign up and connect with you. Yeah, the best place is just go to our site, which is youngscholarsacademy.org. And if you click youngscholarsacademy.org, you'll see our different offerings. There are summer camps that are going on, but also uh, the fall courses that I just mentioned. So that's the best place, youngscholarsacademy.org. Okay. Um, so everyone heard that and we'll also have it um listed as as we release this podcast because I'm more I mean I'm I'm like all in myself and so um anyone who's listening is going to want to be a part of this and I for one am like I told you I'm a big fan and I want I will make sure that I send the parents that I work with your way because I really do believe that what I have seen is um, the parents I work with are always looking for, for something like this for their kids. And I love it because I'm in a rural area uh, where I live and my resources are extremely limited. So I had to be really creative. So here you are offering it. And I think that this is great for, for people like us who don't have any resources. So I just can't say enough good things. Well, thank you, Bridget. That's something I get pressed. You know, again, I live in Los Angeles and, and it's the opposite, right? There's so much support. And a lot of my families are like, when are you going to open an in-person location? And I always say never because of that reason. I have a kid in a camp right now while you and I are talking that's joining from Dubai. There's a kid joining from Nova Scotia, a kid joining from New Zealand. There's a student from Singapore, from Switzerland. These kids are in the middle of the night and they're marooned and they need support. They need to connect with other kids. And it's like their hour a week or five hours a week that that they get to come together um, and do these things. And so we'll always be online for that exact reason. It's to support people, whether you're domestically here in the United States in a rural area or in another country where there isn't really support for differently wired kids. That's why we're a virtual village. 
Yeah, and what a great reason. So on behalf of all of us, I just want to thank you so much again for the work that you're doing. Um, I I am, I, I feel, um, I'm so proud of you. I don't know why I feel that way, but I just do. I just think you're just bubbling and, and f- with so much energy and wow, I can't wait to see what you, what you do. Um, I feel like you're on this incredible um, journey and you're helping so many of us and I am so filled with gratitude that you reached out and I want you back. I want you back uh-huh. on Mother's Guide Through Autism. If you if you would come back and update us and tell us about new programs, because pretty sure you're going to have some. Oh, yeah, Bridget. And I, I really appreciate you and the work that you're doing, the way in which you're showing up for people and, you know, not just on your podcast, but with your book and 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 with your parent support groups and you know, I really, you are a true exponent, I think, in this space of helping people come together and do all the strength-based work and all the kind of deep work and, and the psychological personal work that um, the parents need to do so they can show up every day and, and support their kids and so forth. So you're a rock star and I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to come on your amazing podcast. Well, I appreciate it and right back at you. So All right. Thank you, Mr. Sam. Mr. Sam's going to be back. If you thought that this episode was helpful, which I'm pretty sure most of you are going absolutely, please like and subscribe. Remember, our work is all about knowledge, hope, and inspiration. I will see you in the next episode of A Mother's Guide Through Autism.